WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Okay, good evening. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network. This is the Truth Attack Hour, and I'm back after a couple of week hiatus where I was away from the show. I hope the audience has been enjoying the uh, tapes of previous shows that they've been playing in my absence. And uh, this week, I'm going to go over um, what I, something I've discussed before, which is ideas for a complete economic recovery plan for America, because that's what we should all be looking for now with a new Congress, a new Senate in place, and a new administration coming in two years. We should get the ideas out in circulation and the momentum behind them for a real substantive change that will have a meaningful difference in this country rather than just tweaking things the way they have for 60 years. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, I want to go through again that for the last uh, couple of months, about three months now, I've been challenging any attorney or judge in the country to call into this show and cite for us in the listening audience, one, the statute that specifies the person in subtitle A of Title 26 who's liable for the payment of the income tax other than the withholding agent under Sections 1461 and 63, 1463. We've challenged any attorney or judge to come forward and cite the text of one of the controlling Supreme Court decisions from 1916, where the court declares that the income tax under the 16th Amendment is a direct tax without apportionment, rather than an indirect tax. Of course, no one's called in or has, because what the courts are enforcing today is not what the Supreme Court originally handed down. They're in rebellion. And, of course, we've also asked any attorney or judge to call the show and tell us where the enforcement powers would come from for any new taxing power allegedly created under the 16th Amendment when there's no enforcement clause that was adopted as part of that amendment. So how could any new power allegedly cre first created under the amendment be enforceable by statute when there's no authority to use appropriate legislation to enforce the provisions of the article. All the other amendments have enforcement clauses. What happened to this one? How can the lower courts possibly enforce the income tax as a direct tax without apportionment when there's no authority in the Constitution to use statutes to enforce that power? And finally, we've challenged any attorney to call the show and explain why in Section 61, for sources of income allegedly belonging to citizens, does not include the term salaries or wages, but in Subtitle A in Section 1441B, in a nearly identical list of sources belonging to non-resident aliens, which would apply to non-resident aliens rather than citizens, there the words salary and wages do appear as taxable sources. So why did Congress make this distinction of including the salaries and wages of non-resident aliens as taxable sources in Section 1441B, but then they excluded salaries and wages as taxable sources under Section 61? Why did they do that? Does that have anything to do with the right to work? I'm still waiting for any attorney or judge in the country to call in and establish these things for me, because, you know, this is what the lower courts are trying to tell us in their opinions and decisions and in the tax court, and all of it is a complete fraud. Everybody knows this system is broken, right? It divides the population into classes that are treated differently. That's establishing a system of class warfare rather than united representation. And through the different treatment of the classes that are created, they are set at odds with one another to be diverted with battles amongst themselves within the country rather than to be represented by a single political base. So income tax is responsible for dividing the country into classes, splitting the country into divided subsets that are then treated differently under the law. The tax is not fair and it is not uniform. It is fundamentally unfair. It is not apportioned, and it is not uniform, but graduated, 
which is not in the Constitution, but is in the Communist Manifesto, specifically the second plank. The rich, of course, avoid the tax by machinations like incorporation and trust formation that are generally unavailable to the common man to utilize. And therefore, the weight and burden of the tax falls mostly on the middle and lower classes, right on the backs of labor, who are not allowed to deduct their expenses as a basis from which the tax is calculated. The income tax is not fixed in law, and there is no statutory foundation to support the current enforcement operations. That tax is not understood or known well by the general population, who are, of course, taken advantage of through their ignorance of the subject details. The tax undermines and economically attacks the individual and over-empowers the government and the IRS. It doesn't adequately fund the government. It doesn't raise sufficient revenues and forces the government into a pattern of endless borrowing. The tax is arbitrary and capricious in application and enforcement. The code is complex and confusing, as no two readers or accountants see the same thing in the same law. Ten different accountants or ten different tax experts will give you ten different bottom lines for the amount of tax owed. This is so confusing and complex as to nearly be, arguably, void for vagueness. It's expensive. The system costs billions of dollars and millions of man-hours are expended in its administration and tax planning and tax avoidance. Four to ten percent of all corporate revenues are expended trying to avoid the tax. It's abusive. It wastes precious resources. It's unproductive, and in fact, it destroys national productivity by demotivating the people to work. It pits the government and the corporations against the population, destroying representative government. It promotes being ruled by the government rather than being represented. It hinders business and planning. It hinders profits. It hurts the economy by removing the wages of the citizens from the local stores of the cities, counties, states, and country. It demotivates corporations to show profits or have profitable operations, instead choosing rather to spend their money lobbying Congress for favorable law that doesn't represent the population. It grows the government and corporate bureaucracies, which produce nothing and consumes precious national resources and all profits without any real or meaningful return on the false expenditures or exaggerated expenditures. <clears throat> It's communistic, not constitutional, precisely because it is enforced today as a direct tax rather than as the indirect tax it was declared to be and upheld as. It disconnects the population from the companies building the future, who the companies are no longer interested in showing profits. So it disconnects the people from business investment and investing in and building a better future. It sets loose an army of petty bureaucrats to prey upon the people and deplete their substance in the name of tax only. It sends hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. It creates multiple repeated confrontations, sometimes violent, between the citizenry and the government. And the whole thing, of course, is a constitutional fraud. It destroys the Fourth Amendment, destroys the Fifth Amendment, destroys the freedom of religion, destroys the freedom of speech. It's completely destructive of the constitutional system of private property, personal rights, limited government, written law, and a government that exercises only the specifically enumerated powers as specified in the Constitution and is not allowed to engage in practices that are forbidden. And, of course, now the IRS is being politicized as by the administration and used as a weapon against political and philosophical opposition to intimidate and squelch free speech, legitimate grievance, and all complaints, completely destroying representative government and putting in place the dictatorial state as a totalitarian authority. So all of this emanates out of adopting a communistic socialist funding system, tax system, instead of adhering to the limits of power as laid out in the Constitution for the operation of the government to be funded by. As soon as you start to adopt these socialistic patterns, you get these destructive end results because government needs to consume everything in order to operate. 
so. It takes whatever it can get away with and more and more across time until everything is consumed. So how do we fix this mess? Well, the first thing we have to do, of course, is repeal the income tax, the 16th Amendment. What we need to do is terminate the personal income tax and the withholding of tax from the earnings of citizens. This is the first thing. Income tax is the second plank of the Communist Manifesto. It is repugnant to our national system of morality and law as founded and established in the U.S. Constitution. It is fundamentally repugnant to the therein philosophically established sacrosanct personal right of the individual to own and possess private property and increase such through the accumulation and preservation of the fruits of his own labors. If the good American people were suddenly allowed today to keep and take home 100% of their earned pay, as the Founding Fathers, of course, envisioned, and as was the case for the first 137 years of this nation's existence, it could immediately jumpstart the economy of every single community, village, town, city, county, parish, and state in the nation almost overnight. The American people could finally, immediately, or begin to at least, pay up or pay off their bills, mortgages, and debts, and thus be able to keep their homes or help their family, friends, and neighbors do the same. Also, a certain number of citizens would finally be able to take a chance at starting a new small business of their own. American spending and consumption would resume and certainly increase almost immediately, thus stimulating our economy. A new productivity would begin, and we would again have economic growth through sustainable expansion. All this is easily attainable in a short period of time. <clears throat> but only if the American people are allowed to keep for themselves and allocate for themselves and enjoy themselves the fruits of their own labors within their own American communities rather than have the money siphoned off to a faraway government to fund the wasted, wasteful and unnecessary spending of an out-of-touch and faraway political elite who have embarked on a reckless global spending agenda that is not in the best interests of the American people that they supposedly represent. Why should the American people be denied the use of their own earnings, money, and property when no tax is actually due to be paid to the government under the letter of the law until April 15th, and especially at a point in time when they so desperately need the use of their own funds and resources to keep their own economic heads above water. I would also point out that while there's no tax due until next to April 15th, there's actually no tax imposed on the wages and salaries of a citizen that are earned by right. That's why wages and salaries are omitted from Section 61, as the original income tax law respected the right, the right, fundamental right to work of the citizens and did not make them the subject of the tax. The object of the tax is the activity of the foreign persons whom the withholding agent, the tax collector, is authorized to collect the tax from. So... The first thing we need to do to correct this system of complete fraud is get rid of the fraud itself and to cease and desist with the withholding and collection of income tax from the American citizens. Let them earn the money on their paychecks and spend the money in their own communities. America will be much better served. <clears throat> the economy will be stimulated. That can be repaid, and we can again have a sustainable economy going forward. So that's how you fix the problem is you stop tinkering it, you throw it away and recognize you need a new system. Okay, so now you've thrown away the income tax, government has no revenue, so what are you going to do? All right, well, the idea there is we're going to reform the corporate system as well. And, of course, the corporate system right now doesn't have the corporations providing anything at all, nearly, because they deduct all of their profits through artificially inflated expenses. They spend most of their time planning not to make profits, but how to not have much profits. That's not the purpose of business, to avoid profits. The purpose of business is to make as much profits as possible to repay the shareholders with dividends. Okay, we're coming up on the break. We'll be back in five minutes to discuss the next part of the proposal to fix the economic system. This is Thomas Freed on the Truth Attack Hour at Liberty Works Radio Network. We'll be back in a few minutes. back. 
back. This is Thomas Reed from the Liberty Works Radio Network. And this is the Truth Attack Hour, Thomas Freed, the Liberty Works Radio Network. We're back, and I spent the first third of the show here talking about all the things that are wrong with the system that we have, why it has to be changed, and I don't mean just tweaked, I don't mean modified, I mean thrown away and put back onto a constitutional basis. And I ran through all the things that are wrong with it and pointed out that if the American people were allowed to keep their earnings, Perhaps we could get this economy running again. And, of course, if you're going to remove the income tax from the backs of labor, you need to find another source of revenues for the government. And, of course, the people who are really earning the big dollars in this country are not the individuals, but the corporations, the companies. They're the ones paying all the individuals who are working, so clearly they're the ones who are actually making all the money. So, uh, and the current system doesn't exact anything from them. So the solution to replacing the system, of course, is to flat tax corporate earnings, not income, without regard to expenses. And, of course, not at a 35% rate, more like 3%. But the taxation of income, because it intrudes upon and ultimately destroys the individual's right to private property, is also the destruction of capitalism and the capitalist system. Thus, what we are now witnessing is not the collapse of capitalism, as it has so popularly but fraudulently been portrayed by the broadcast and print media, but rather what we are actually witnessing is the collapse of progressive socialist system that has been in place since 1913 when the Federal Reserve Bank's newly granted monopoly on money and credit, together with the federal income tax, were used to convert America from a constitutional system of private property and limited government to a socialist system of a quasi-Marxist state where the government is unconstitutionally empowered to take 100% of the proceeds of a person's labors if it wishes to do so. This is not capitalism. Nor is it a moral system of private property, nor is it the constitutional taxation that was upheld by the Supreme Court when tested in 1916. Capitalism is, of course, actually the economic system wherein a free people voluntarily create contractual uh, relationships, partnerships in the form of uh, partnerships and then companies in order to legally maximize the profits of the business conducted, in order to provide a return on the investment in the form of interest or a dividend to be paid to their shareholding investors and lenders on a regular basis. Under a true capitalist system, the people are motivated to invest in new and growing businesses because the successful businesses return the investment to the investors many times over. The whole capitalist system works only because companies are operated in a manner that is designed to legally maximize operational profits in order to make large returns on investments, where principal is repaid many times over to the investors with interest through dividends and appreciating stock prices while still growing the company and business at a manageable and sustainable rate. Today, of course, this situation does not exist because of the corporate income tax. Since 1913 and the adoption of the income tax under the 16th Amendment, companies have been operating in a, in a, <clears throat> operating in a manner not to make profits, but instead to avoid showing any profits at all at the end of the accounting year in order to avoid paying any income tax. Thus, there is rarely much profit for the company to distribute at the end of the year because it has all been expensed away to avoid paying federal income tax. Thus, there is no meaningful return of capital made to the shareholders, and thus very little apparent incentive for any average person to invest their money in any business, new or old, rather than just spend it on themselves. Furthermore, this near total loss to the government of corporate tax revenue, expensed and deducted away from the depleted profits of the corporation, results in insufficient tax revenues for the government to operate, and thus compels the government to fraudulently shift the burden of the federal income tax from the intended corporate subjects to the backs of we, the people, the labor class. 
thus directly taking from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned in a very un-American taxing system that effectively transforms America from a free nation based on private property to a controlled state based on the government's power to take whatever it says it needs and however much it wants, right up to 100 percent. Whenever it, whatever it wants or claims it needs to, the taxation of income insidiously destroys the capitalist system by destroying the corporate motivation to show profit. This perversion of the capitalist system has resulted in the American companies expending all of their profits artificially on themselves, thus growing into huge, impersonal, wealthy, bureaucratic monoliths that act more like an extension of the government and its agencies' bureaucracies than as the private property and agent of the people owning the company, the shareholders. This fascist merger between the enormous wealth of the corporate bureaucracy and the enormous power of the political government bureaucracy is extremely dangerous to the rights and liberties of the American people. So, since 1913, when Congress taxed income instead of earnings, the intended corporate subjects of the federal income tax have been living high on the hog, generating needless and excessive business expenses in order to reduce or eliminate nearly all of the corporate profit and income, so as to avoid paying any or very much tax on the company's business. Because of this philosophical mistake made by Congress in 1913, very few of the intended corporate subjects today actually serve as a meaningful revenue stream to the U.S. government. Bonuses are passed out, new cars are perked, and the paid trips to conventions in Hawaii, China, Paris, Rome, Las Vegas, and Cannes are all accounted for, etc., etc., and the government is therein forced to unconstitutionally and unlawfully extract by extortion its revenue funding directly from the sovereign, we the people, rather than being able to survive on the indirect tax revenues of its lawful subjects, the corporations, and foreign parties present in the U.S. However, just as Congress is authorized to tax the income of the corporations as an excise on corporate activity, they are also constitutionally authorized to tax the earnings or total revenues of the corporation as an excise as well. If the government eliminated the corporate income tax entirely, and just flat taxed all corporate revenues at the rate of 3% without regard for any expenses, everything in this country could be fixed in three months without unconstitutionally directly taxing the American people a single dime more. With this simple change, everything can be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Every company in the nation, instead of being able and allowed to entirely avoid paying any federal tax at all and passing its exorbitant and exaggerated expenses to the American taxpayers, would instead immediately all become a meaningful revenue stream to the U.S. government on a monthly basis, regardless of their profit or income. Every business in the country would immediately terminate all needless expensing away of business profit. They would all start making their business decisions based on good business practices rather than on accounting gimmicks and games or tax considerations, because there would be none. And of course, they would then all start making more money, thus paying more tax and dividends. Thus, not only raising more money for the government, but also stimulating more and more investment in other businesses all across the country. Under this plan, every business in the nation would immediately become a meaningful revenue stream to the U.S. government on a monthly basis. Business will boom, debts will be paid off, sales will grow, crash registers will start ringing, new small businesses will be started, local economies will begin to grow and then explode. There will be beginning of a complete restoration of the system of private property and capitalism instituting a return to the recognition of fundamental individual rights this country was founded on 
and an expansion of liberty, freedom, and the result of dynamic economic vitality that comes only from that free existence. Revenue for the government, freedom for the people. Now that sounds like a real plan for America. Restore the Constitution and abandon the second plank of the Communist Manifesto as the ruling philosophical doctrine for taxation in this nation. True prosperity comes only from the excess produced out of personal liberty and individual freedom, and never from the government. This is how we can restore the general public's willingness to invest again invest again in the businesses building our future. Okay, so what I'm proposing is that the corporate tax be operated just kind of like the same way a sales tax does, 3% on everything that passes their registers. And uh, if you do that, every company will be contributing money every month, and then the government will have a monthly budget within which it will have to learn to live. The businesses will be unencumbered and will be freed up to go ahead and focus on making money rather than not making too much money. This, of course, does nothing but build bureaucracies. What do you do with all that excess capital? You hire people. You hire people. So the institutions get more and more top-heavy with bureaucracies, and they get less and less efficient with their services and businesses. Prices go up. Companies become large monoliths. They become monopolistic. Everybody is ill-served by the system. We need to restore the competitiveness between companies so that those with good ideas can... Uh, uh, make uh, uh, that they can be recognized. Okay, and of course, I've always said that uh, it would help in getting this done. You need to pass amend three amendments to the U.S. Constitution to get to where we need to do. You need to amend the Constitution three times. First, repealing the second, 16th Amendment. Need we say more? Second, we need an amendment defining interstate commerce as only those goods that actually cross state lines and nothing else. And third, we need an amendment prohibiting all corporations who do not vote and who are not supposed to be represented by Congress from contributing any money at all to any federal politician or political cause for any purpose. If they want to spend their money advertising on TV or speaking on TV, as recently upheld by the Supreme Court, that's fine, but no money at all should be allowed to be directed or given directly to the politicians or their causes or their campaigns or their projects or their charities or their families or their friends or their companies or their business partners or anything else involved with them. We've got to end the corporate involvement with our political process. They don't vote. They shouldn't be represented. Politicians should be paying attention to the individual, the collective people, not the corporate leadership. Um, government by this corporate bribery has to be terminated, and this is the way to do it. No more money from corporations coming to the government anyway at all. Make them pass the money out to their shareholders. Okay, next idea. No more welfare checks for millionaires. Let's start means testing Social Security recipients. Just absolutely insane that every year your government sends a letter to people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates telling them, hey, how come you haven't filed for your Social Security benefits? Come on down here. We got a check for you. We want to give you money. This is just nutty. This is just nutty. I mean, it's not like they didn't pay in, but Social Security is not a pension. It's not a, it's not a retirement. It's not an entitlement. It's a tax, and although you might be eligible to get some of your money back, it's just nutty that they're writing billionaires trying to give them these, 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 these government welfare dollars. Okay, sounds like we're coming up on another break. We'll be back in five minutes with more discussion on ideas for how to fix the economic mess. This is Thomas Freed at the Liberty Works Radio Network for the Truth Attack Hour. We'll be back in five We 
I've been running down some of my ideas for trying to improve this economy and fix our national situation. And I was up to uh, talking about uh, means-testing Social Security recipients, because our current Social Security program is nothing but a failing Ponzi pyramid scheme. It was not originally designed as a retirement savings program or an insurance program or a pension, nor as an entitlement program that it has obviously become. It is supposed to be a tax that supports a welfare program. By making this system an entitlement, you virtually guarantee the insolvency and eventual bankruptcy of the nation. By making this program an entitlement, you completely reverse the intended effect of transferring wealth from the rich to the poor and actually instead transfer wealth from the poor to the wealthy and middle classes. Recipients of Social Security payments must be means tested if the program is to remain viable within today's demographics. Okay. Uh, I think we said uh, next, cut the Social Security tax in half. If we means test the Social Security recipients, we can cut the Social Security tax in half and reduce it to about 8% of payroll, 4% employee, 4% employer, in place of the current, um, what is it now, somewhere between 12 and 16. So uh, we can then shift the entire welfare burden to the employer and make employee participation voluntary, all while restoring complete solvency and financial viability to the program's operation, making it sustainable for future generations. And, uh, and with that 4% that the employee is contributing on a set-aside, you privatize Social Security retirement withholding, allowing the individual investment in the stock and bond markets with their portion of the contribution. Right now, there is nothing at all in your Social Security account. There never will be. It is completely empty. If you had been allowed to buy stock with those funds, or at least the part that you contributed as opposed to your employer, you would have lost some portion of your holdings in the collapse a few years ago, but if you just held out, you'd have gotten it all back. And at least you'd have had real assets in your retirement account instead of the nothing that exists there now. Even if it hadn't recovered, you'd have something. So there is no money, no assets, no real holdings whatsoever currently in your Social Security retirement account, which is really nothing more than a worthless piece of fictional accounting paper printed by the operator, uh, the government, but not representative of any real holdings, just like Bernie Madoff's Ponzi pyramid operation. Wouldn't you like to have something in your retirement account instead of nothing? to retire on? Think about it. If the Social Security system is to viably continue as a personal retirement account system, it must be allowed, it must be modified to allow for the investment in actual assets with the withheld funds. The government should keep only the Social Security taxes that the employers pay in and use those funds to pay eligible beneficiaries and release to the citizens some investment control over the 4% portion that the citizens themselves pay for retirement investment in T-bills and or certain bond and or mutual funds or approved blue chip stocks. As all of these monies flow into the newly invigorated stock market and related investment vehicles and funds, the market will decline, will halt, and reverse itself. Of course, that's already occurred because of all the money they printed, but this is just fundamental business. The more people that have capital to invest, the more they're motivated to do so, the more they will. Okay, next idea. Let's terminate the individual health care mandate. I've spoken about this before where uh, the federal government has no constitutional authority whatsoever to require citizens to buy health care insurance or any other product, manufactured or otherwise. Uh, the Supreme Court was fairly clear about this in the 1930s when it ruled in a specific decision that the employer has no uh, provision for free medical assistance, nursing, clothing, food, housing, and education of children, and a hundred other matters, matters might with equal propriety be proposed as tending to relieve the employee of mental strain and worry. Can it fairly be said that the power of Congress to regulate interstate commerce extends to the prescription of any or all of these things? It is not apparent that they are really and essentially related solely to the social welfare of the worker, and therefore remote from any regulation of commerce as such. 
We think the answer is plain. These matters obviously lie outside the orbit of congressional power. Now, clearly that position has changed because, of course, Judge Roberts recently ruled in the health care decision that the government may have the power to impose this penalty as a tax. And I've spoken before that that's a complete fraudulent decision. If you read his decision, you'll see that what he declares is that the triggering condition for the application of the tax is not having any insurance. But not having any insurance is the natural condition that you were born into. So any tax on the natural condition is actually a tax on your existence, and any tax on your existence is a direct tax, and direct taxes still have to be apportioned to the states, which means they can't make you pay that tax. It has to be apportioned to the state government to pay its share. So, there you have it. Mr. Roberts' decision is entirely wrong because his premise for the application of the tax is that you exist in the natural condition, i.e. refusing government's command to buy an insurance product that they have no constitutional authority to compel you to buy. They have the authority to regulate interstate commerce, not to manufacturing it to compel people to consume products. So, next idea is to allow interstate competition in the healthcare industry. Uh, if we had interstate competition, prices would go down and options would be greater. Uh, the federal government wants to encourage the American people and promote their buying personal health care insurance coverage for themselves and their families and thus increase the number of citizens who have health care coverage in America. But all the government needs to do is break the legislated interstate health care monopolies that they have created in the health care insurance industry in each of the 50 states and make it legal for the insurance companies to sell medical insurance policies and products across state lines to citizens in other states that want to buy that policy. By this simple change of promoting through congressional legislation greater competition amongst the insurance companies providing these health care plans and policies to America, the federal government, without the use of any force at all, without any law unconstitutionally attempting to compel anyone to do or buy anything, can indirectly bring about the improvement of the quality of the care covered by the policies offered while simultaneously lowering the cost of the policies sold. Isn't free market competition, freed of artificial monopolistic practices, wonderful? Of course, this would also include eliminating the mandated slate of coverage op that are no longer options, which should be restored as a list of menu options for citizens to choose what they want covered and what they don't want. The high prices are a result of the insurance companies being required to cover everything for everybody rather than letting people pick the policy coverages that they want. So you have to get rid of the mandated menu and the mandated insurance individual, the individual mandate. Uh, next thing we should do to fix this mess is eliminate Medicare and Medicaid fraud by verifying claims before payment is made rather than afterwards, <laughs> when, of course, they are no longer verifiable. I think we should provide scholarships for more doctors and nurses to serve America's health care needs. It's doctors and nurses that provide health care to people, not insurance companies. Insurance companies do not exist to provide health care. Compelling everyone to have insurance will not provide health care to everyone. It will only provide enormous profits for the insurance companies, which is exactly what's happening. It's really funny here. Before Obamacare, the insurance companies were the enemy. And now Obama has partnered up with them buddy-buddy, and they're making money hand over foot. They no longer have to pay out hardly anything, as the individual is responsible for about the first fifteen to $20,000 out of pocket before the insurance companies pay anything, because the cost of premiums went up so high and the cost of deductibles went up so much. So the insurance companies are making money hand over foot. Compelling everyone to buy insurance isn't giving them health care. It's going to end up denying them, and it's going to end up shorting the doctors on payment. So you're going to have less doctors, more people, and more lines, and uh, 
going to become rationed care. There's no question about it. Okay, so we need more doctors and nurses. You do that by providing scholarships. And, of course, in repayment of the scholarship, the same way that the military requires service for a certain number of years after graduation, so too would the doctors and nurses being given these scholarships be required to serve in the new U.S. Health Care Corps organization. Uh, that way we could uh, build out a supply of doctors and nurses to provide health care to individuals rather than to take their money and give them a piece of paper and say, now you're covered, when in fact we know that's not going to get them access to health care. Um, okay, we of course need to enact a meaningful medical tort reform legislation, and they need to fix the VA. You know, you have a huge network of hospitals and clinics that are underutilized and misadministrated. Personally, I think this network could be reinvigorated with a supply of doctors and nurses from the U.S. Health Corps, and those facilities could then be used to provide basic clinic services, not just to the veterans, but to the entire American public. This network was built to serve a veteran corps of some 8 to 10 million individuals after World War II, and we're down to just a couple million now. So. Uh, it should be opened up. You shouldn't let the network decay and close down the facilities. You should utilize them to provide a U.S. national network uh, structure in, in the areas where we need it. So now we come to immigration. And, of course, I said before, the first thing you need to do is you can fix the immigration policy almost overnight by simply enforcing the law that's already on the books. And that, of course, is the law that requires the withholding agent to deduct and withhold some 30% of all payments made to non-resident aliens. That's uh, Title 26, United States Code, Section 1441A. This is where that uh, tax collector, the withholding agent, is required to administer the duty to collect the tax, and then he's made liable for the tax that he's collected. And this is how the tax is indirect. And if you took 30% of the payments made to all the non-resident aliens here today, and that were required by all employers giving them jobs and work, then probably most of them would leave because they're not going to work for 66 bucks a day instead of 100 and then they're not going to have any money to send home and that doesn't really make it worth it to come here nobody's going to come here to work and not get paid the reason why they come here is because employers would rather hire them to avoid the withholding issues they have to take on with citizens it's very temporary it puts the employer in a strong position so you know, we need to close and seal the Mexican-American border, not just for the reason of that, but also for national security reasons. It's time we did that. Then, of course, we need to start the national debate about how to deal with the 25 million immigrants who are already here, and Obama has kind of forced that issue, hasn't he? I think that we need to eliminate corporate and agricultural subsidies and all pay-to-not-plant programs. They started to do that, but there's still a lot more they could do. We do need to identify some way to expend, uh, create a national infrastructure modernization and repair program so that we can keep our infrastructure running because it is that infrastructure upon which our economy is based and will grow. It can't collapse out from underneath you without having an effect on the national economy. So that needs to be addressed and repaired, and that could provide a lot of work, a lot of jobs, and a lot of contracted business if uh, managed correctly rather than corruptly. Of course, the Federal Reserve needs to stop recklessly printing money and issuing credit, and the federal government needs to terminate federal mortgage lending and all other lending operations. There's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to lend money. They can borrow money on the credit of the United States, but they aren't authorized to lend. Okay, looks like we're coming up on the end of the show. We're almost through the list. Maybe I'll finish it up next time. We'll see. This is Thomas Freed, the Liberty Works Radio Network, the Truth Attack Hour. Hoping you enjoyed the show, and I'll see you again next week. Thank you.